So now that we're recording, I want to say again, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our very special 17 Men presentation with Shane Davidson. My name is Jennifer Green, Director of Education for the Chester County History Center, and I want to first and foremost thank all of you for joining us this evening, for supporting the History Center, for supporting our programs and our amazing collections. It means the world to us. So first, before we get started with the presentation, I just want to mention a little bit about how 17 men ended up at the History Center. We first started talking about the exhibit in, I believe it was the fall of 2021, after Brett Hovington brought it to our attention and put us in touch with Shane. With the generous support of Civil War Trails, we were able to have it safely shipped to us and installed in the first level of our museum building, which is called Horticultural Hall. If you'd like to come visit the exhibit in person, we are open Tuesdays through Saturdays, 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And the exhibit is included in your admission price. So no discussion of 17 men is complete without a proper introduction for Shane Davidson. A native of St. Louis or St. Louis, Missouri, Shane Davidson holds a BFA from California Institute of the Arts and an MFA in medical and biological illustration from the University of Michigan. After she retired from commercial illustration, she focused her attention on genealogy. And from there, I will let her tell you about how this led to the creation of the 17 Men exhibit. So without further ado, I introduce Shane Davidson. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, that was a great introduction, Jennifer, thank you. And um, yeah, so genealogy is really my passion. I, I enjoy doing it very much. I would say I have dual passions, genealogy and vintage photography. So um, I, the way 17 Men started was completely unplanned and by accident. Um, I was building a family tree for a friend, uh, just, you know, enjoying doing it for her, uh, not, not doing it as a job or anything. And uh, we started to, uh, you know, as the tree was coming together, we, um, I began to realize it was a really, she had a very interesting family and an interesting tree. And I wanted some photographs to fill out the tree and, and give all these people that I had discovered, um, put faces to these names. So I asked her for photos and she really didn't have very many, but she put me in touch with a cousin who lives in Illinois, who had all the family photos. And that woman was very gracious and she shared her huge collection with me and she photographed everything and emailed it to me. And in the process of of doing that, she casually mentioned, we, we were emailing back and forth, and she mentioned that she had this tiny photo album that had belonged to her great-grandfather, uh, who was a captain in the Civil War. He was a captain. He had started out in the New Jersey Infantry, but then he had moved into the USCT when that was formed. It began to be formed in 1863. That was the United, that's the United States Colored Troops, was was formed in 1863 after um, the Emancipation Procl Proclamation. So she mentioned that she had this photo album and it was of his men. Uh, and um, would I be interested in seeing it? You know, she explained that, they, that the men were not part of her family tree, which of course I understood. So I said, sure, I would love to see the, the, the photo album. And uh, this is, this is her ancestor, the, the lady who did all the photographing of, of uh, her family album. This is her ancestor, uh, Captain William Prickett. And this photo album had belonged to him during his, uh, he had gotten it during his time in the uh, USCT. And we didn't really know much about it other than that. So she started photographing each, and, and the album is very tiny. It's, uh, it's the type of album that was made, probably uh, started to be made during the Civil War so that a, a, a man could collect photos and put them, keep them in his, maybe his jacket pocket, something like that. 
So um, she started photographing these, these photos and sending them to me. And here is a picture of the album. So you can get with the uh, ruler on the side, you can get a sense of the size of the album, how, how small it is. So anyway, she started to send me the photos and she would only send me a couple at a time. And gradually these photos began to appear in my inbox. And I am not, I don't collect Civil War photos and I'm not really uh, at all an expert on the Civil War, but I did understand that photos of, of, of African-American men who served during the Civil War in the Army were very rare. Uh, they're highly, they're highly collectible and they're very rare. So, um, I, and I noticed as I, as these photos came in, when I was looking at them, that the, the men's names were on the photos. Um, and I thought that was really, really interesting because not only are photos of African Americans during the Civil War rare, photos of identified African Americans are extraordinarily rare. So I was just really intrigued with these photos and I was looking at those, the writing and I asked her, what do you know about this writing? And she really, I don't know if she'd ever, I, I don't think she'd looked at the album in a long time. It had been in her kitchen pantry. And I don't think she realized that, that the right, there was writing on the photos and these, this was probably identification uh, the, that the men were at being identified on the photos. So I thought, wow, I've just got, I'm, I'm a genealogy freak and I've got to see if these names are really correct and if they match up and are these really, you know, are these, are these names identifying these men? And what more can I find out about them? They just, I was just really intrigued by them. So I started to try to build a family tree for each man. And I also started to do a little bit of research on um, what the men had done during the war. And they, uh, along with a number of regiments, they trained at Camp William Penn, which is not too far away from uh, Chester County uh, uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, so on the left, you see uh, an illustration of, of a regiment. Nobody knows which one it is. Uh, and on the right, you see a, a rare photo of a number of the soldiers standing at attention at the camp. The camp is now gone. Uh, it was taken down after the war was over. And there's a, there's a gate that's left. And that's all that's left. I have been there and there's a gate. <clears throat> so. That's where the men trained. And um, the next thing to do was to look, to get all of the military records of each man and see, did they match up? Does this seem like these identifications are accurate with uh, the men's records? So fortunately, you know, we have <clears throat> all these uh, military records from the Civil War, and they're pretty detailed, actually. And these were available on a website called Fold3, which I think is owned by Ancestry.com, but it's purely military records. There are some military records available in other places like Family Search and Ancestry, but if you want to get the bulk of the records you uh, and you want to get them online, you would look at Fold3. So all of the records for the USCT um, regiments were, I have been scanned and they were all available. So I just knowing that uh, Captain Prickett was the head of company G of the 25th USCT, I just went right to that company. So that made it easier and um, <clears throat> started looking up the men. And so here we see, the photo of one of the men, Sergeant Hiram White. And we see his military record on the left. And we can see that he was 19 years old when he signed up. He was five foot six, 
complexion, eye color, hair color, those were all things that were listed. Uh, where was he born? It says Cumberland County, New Jersey. His occupation was a laborer. He signed up February 1st, 1864 in Philadelphia, PA. Uh, signed up by Colonel Wagner for a term of three years, appointed Sergeant April 2nd, 1864. And then there's more in information about his muster out. So here we go, Sergeant Hiram White. He looks about the right age. You know, he was a Sergeant. Okay, I'm feeling like, yeah, this is good. These, these, uh, these photos do appear to be accurately identified. So <clears throat> the next thing I wanted to do was kind of get a sense of what did we have here in this album? Where, who were these guys? Where were they from? And we had a really interesting mix of men we had a number of men, including Hiram, who you just saw, uh, who are, were free men. Uh, they were from New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So we had six men from New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And then we had seven men from border states, Delaware and Maryland. And um, as it would turn out, as the research went on, those men would be an interesting mix of men who were both free and enslaved when they signed up for uh, the army. And then we had two men from Confederate states, con the Confederate states of Mississippi and Tennessee. We had a man from Washington, DC, which um, had been a slave area until 1862. And then we had a, one unknown man who was unfortunately not identified. So, <clears throat> Um, give you a little bit more background about where they all signed up um, on this map, which is in my book. The, uh, you can see Camp William Penn, location of Camp William Penn, where they trained. And then uh, the, in the, the italic typeface, the places where they signed up, which were Trenton, New Jersey, Philadelphia, PA, Wilmington, Delaware, uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and Waterford, Pennsylvania. So um, a number of different places that they all signed up. And Waterford became kind of interesting later be, uh, as, I, as my research went on, because I believe it's possible that some of the men who signed up in Waterford may have been coming back from Canada, may have been in Canada. I never found proof of that, but they may have gone to Canada to escape slavery and come back then to, uh, to serve. Um, they ended up serving at Fort Barrancas in uh, Florida. They uh, were sent down there, you know, nobody really had any ability to say where they wanted to serve. So they were sent down to Fort Barrancas. It was a very important location being close to New Orleans. And uh, they did basically uh, guard duty down at Fort Barrancas and actually the 17 Men Show has shown down at Fort Brancus, and I really wanted to go, but unfortunately it was right at the start of the pandemic, so I never made it down there. But anyway, here's, here's a couple of shots of what is left of the fort down there. So, so this would be where they served. They served out their, their time. So <clears throat> the next thing to do, it was, for me to do was to build a family tree for every man. And um, I did that using uh, ancestry.com. I uh, went through all the censuses. That would, that would be where I started. And um, so uh, other than the military, after the military records would be census records. So here we have this man, Sergeant Stephen Johnson was the top ranked man in this group. He was a first sergeant, and um, that was the highest rank that an African American man generally could achieve. There were a few exceptions to that, but, but generally an enlisted man, that was as far up as he could go. Um, so this is uh, Stephen on the 1870 census. The war is over for, has been over for five years now. And we see him on the 1870 census living in New Jersey. 
he's working, he's highlighted in yellow on the census record here. He's living in New Jersey with the family of Scipio Willits and who owns a livery stable or works at a livery stable. And Stephen is working as a coachman. So I went through uh, all the censuses to try to locate every man. And for the most part, I was able to locate the men uh, pretty, to my mind for certain, on at least one census record. And, uh, and for some, I was able to locate them on many census records. So that was, that was great in, in order to help build up a family tree for each man. But then there were also pension records that um, became real important in trying to trace the, man, the men, especially later in their lives. And pensions came in, there were pensions for disability beginning uh, right away with the Civil War, but everyone who had served was allowed to apply for a pension later, later in the 19th century. And here we see, this is not the full record, but here we see the pension card for uh, Bayard Sorden, one of the men. Uh, Bayard Sorden was from Delaware. And uh, we see some really crucial information. If you look at the bottom of the card, you see that he died June 16th, 1920 in Wilmington, Delaware. So that is great. We have a death date now for him because by and large, there would be no, uh, no death certificates during this time period. Uh, and in addition, if you look towards the middle of the card, we see that he was married when he died because on June 24th, 1920, over on the left of the card, you see his widow applied for a widow's pension. Also, he had applied for an invalid pension on uh, August 11th, 1890. So lots of information there. And I found that for all the men who applied for pensions. Um, delving a little deeper though, I had to go and also try to get some information that was not necessarily online. So the National Archives in Washington DC has all the pension records for every person who has served in the United States military. And I went online and I requested all the pension records for all the men for whom I had found pension uh, information, pension cards, like you saw in the previous slide with Bayard. And, uh, and here is a one page of the pension record of Sergeant Hiram White. And this gives us more really great um, family information for building a tree because they're asking him, are you married? Yeah, uh, and if so, what's your wife's name? And he says, yes, I'm married. My wife is Mariah Taylor. Uh, she's now Mariah White. Uh, where were you married? Uh, by whom? Uh, July 25th, 1883, we were married by Elder G.F. Wade. Uh, does a record of the marriage exist? He says he probably doesn't, maybe he doesn't totally understand what they want. Uh, he says, very good, a very good record. Um, were you previously married? No. Uh, and do you have any children living? And if so, please state their names. Yes, I have a child, Harry Claude White, born January 10th, 1888. Signed Hiram White, July 4th, 1898. Wonderful, this is great. This really helped me in building a tree for Hiram. Um, <clears throat> another interesting and disturbing item that you will come across if you look at, at for uh, military records for uh, African-American men who served in the Civil War is there are records of their slaveholders who in border states, slaveholders were allowed by the federal government to sign their enslaved individual up to the in the army and get the bounty, this $300 bounty that would normally have been paid to the man and was paid to all of the men who signed up themselves. Uh, the slaveholder got that bounty. So here we have a record from Georgetown, Delaware of Caleb Layton, who is uh, in Sussex County, state of Delaware. 
and he has proved his loyalty to the Constitution and the government of the United States and has established his ownership, his title of the ownership of George H. Mitchell, a slave enlisted at Wilmington, Delaware on the 28th day of January, 1864. So basically we have information about who was the slaveholder of George Mitchell uh, and where, where did they live? And this would be one document, but there are many, many documents. Um, just go back to that a sec. This is only one of many. Uh, for the couple of men who were signed up by slaveholders, and those were men in Delaware, uh, George Mitchell, George Watson, uh, there was extensive information of, in these slaveholder documents. So they are well worth looking at to, you'll, you may get information about who their parents were precise, more precisely when they're born. They're, um, you know, they're, it's, a, it's a, a sad component of American history, but it is really valuable now to us as genealogists. So for every man, as I sort of said earlier, I built a family tree. And this is what a tree looks like when you do it on Ancestry.com. Um, so this is a family tree of Corporal Prince Shorts. Uh, he was a man also from Delaware. And um, you can see I found him on the 1870 census, the 1880 census. He was on the 1890 veterans schedule. Um, so, and I found him on a lot of city directories. I found information about his wife and, and his, I found the, the names of all his children and, and the year they were born. So was able to do a pretty, pretty large family tree uh, for, for Prince Shorts. Um, for some men, not so much. Some were much smaller, um, but anyway, so it, it varied. So after amassing all this information <clears throat> and building these family trees, I was kind of like, hmm, okay, well, what am I gonna do now? Um, I've, had, I've really enjoyed putting these together. I've learned a lot of history, it's been great. Now maybe it's an opportunity for me to bring my artistic skills in and do some drawings of the men because I had felt like I'd gotten to know them and the photos are so tiny that I felt like there was a lot more that, that we might be able to see uh, by enlarging those photos to life size and making color drawings of them. So the first thing I needed to do uh, was um, the, the, the photos, there are two types of photos in this album. There are some photos that are printed on paper, which would be more like a photo that we would be familiar with nowadays. There was a negative made, and then a positive was made of that photo on a piece of paper. And the photo on the left of Corporal Solomon Frister is one of those paper photos. But the majority of the photos in the album are actually tintypes. Now a tintype is a photo that was really popular during the Civil War. And a tintype is a photo that is uh, where there is no negative. Essentially, the, um, the, the photo is on the plate of metal. And, and that's really the negative is, is what you see. So uh, it's just that when you put it on metal, it turns, it looks like a positive. So uh, the photo of Private Theodore Tennant on the right is a, uh, is a tintype. The photos, the paper photos, like the photo of Solomon Frister did not need to be flipped, but the photos that, were tin, that are tintypes, like of uh, Private Tennant, had to be flipped in order to be accurate to life because these are really negatives, basically. So I had to flip all those uh, flip all those photos before I started to do to do the drawings, and I also had to do a lot of research into what they are wearing. 
because I, as I said, I'm not a Civil War buff. I really didn't know that much about kepis and guns and what are these things they've got on their shoulders. They turned out to be shoulder scales, which you can see in the middle on the right. And what are these um, uh, eagle medals that they're wearing? So lots of research had to be done and that could all be done online, which is what the internet is great for. So, so the next thing I did was take each photo <coughs> and enlarge it to life size. And then I carefully did a drawing of each photo, sort of just an outline drawing to make sure I got all the, uh, the placement of the eyes and the nose and mouth and got everything properly oriented and, and in the right size. And then I took that sketch and I transferred it to a, uh, a card, a, pa a sort of thick paper. And um, I used soft color pencils called Derwent, Derwent Color Soft Pencils to make each drawing. And then my final um, phase was to make an ink inkjet print of the military record of each man on wax paper and then put it down and make a transfer print uh, onto the drawing of the inkjet ink print and rub it on and you, you if you see the exhibit you'll see the military records um, on each drawing so once the group was completed uh, i I didn't really have any intention of what I was going to do with it, but um, here in Michigan, we have, we used to have, it's now it's, um, ended, but we used to have a big art show in, every year in Grand Rapids called Art Prize. And so I thought that if I submitted it to Art Prize, it would be a good way to kind of gauge how interested people were in, in the project because I really didn't have any idea of whether, whether anybody would, would be interested. So I submitted it to Art Prize, and it was shown at um, the Convention Center, which was a venue that got a lot of foot traffic, so that was nice. And it was like, it was just, I was overwhelmed with how many people came to see it. And I, I stayed during the show, which lasted a couple weeks, and people would come up and talk to me and ask me all sorts of questions about the men and you know how did they sign up and who even were these a lot of people didn't know that african american men fought during the civil war and so just i i fielded huge amounts of questions during that that show and it, it was really fun and and i felt like it it has served a good purpose of, of really educating people. And um, so then several people had mentioned to me in the Art Prize show that there was a new museum opening soon in uh, Washington, DC, the National, uh, the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. And people thought that, that they might be interested in the, um, in the drawings. So I, once I got back home, I got in touch with them and they were still taking, you know, the museum wasn't gonna open for maybe a year. They were still taking inquiries and, and uh, people were, you know, offering items for their collection. So I got in touch and they said, yeah, but the drawings weren't really in their um, collection area, but they were quite interested in the album and they had never, you know, really heard of, this type of album before. Nothing like this had ever surfaced to their knowledge. So I, of course, the album wasn't mine, um, but I got in touch with the um, owners of the album and um, they said uh, that they were interested in, in possibly donating the album. So they, you know, talked to the curators and then uh, we all, the two owners and I all went to Washington DC together to meet with the curators. And this was the first time that I had an opportunity to actually see the album myself. So that was really exciting because I had just been working from, you know, photographs of the album. So I got to see the album. We met with the curators. They were very fascinated. You see a photo that I snapped of 
of a couple of the photography curators on the left and the military history curator. Um, and so ultimately the family decided to donate the album. And on the right, you see it in uh, one of the exhibit cases after the museum finally opened. We went to the opening and, uh, and we're very excited to go up and see, and see the album on display. So <clears throat> another thing that I hoped to do um, as time went on was I, I had hoped that I would um, perhaps get to meet some of the descendants of some of the men. <laughs> And so uh, there was another show of the, of the 17 men in Baltimore. And uh, it was very exciting that the great grandson of Captain Prickett, who you see on, on the right there, and the granddaughter of one of the men, Private James Tall on the left, were, were there simultaneously and were able to come at the same time to the opening. And we all got to meet and, and it was just, really, really a great, a wonderful opportunity. Um, so that was really fun. And, uh, and I'll just finish here with uh, a quote from Frederick Douglass that I think is quite, quite appropriate, particularly to this, uh, the drawing of George Mitchell, who was an enslaved man who was signed up by his slaveholder in Delaware to the USCT. Thank you, Shane, so much for that presentation. That was fabulous. Sure, sure. good. Um, would you like to take some questions? Mm -hmm. All right, we've had a few questions in the chat box. If you have questions, please uh, put them in there and I'll make sure we get to them before the end of the presentation. And I also want to take another moment to thank Civil War Trails for making it possible to have all of this amazing artwork shipped to our facility. So without further ado, I will get to the questions. Olivia asked, where do you research pension records uh, online? Yes, well, you can research them at uh, uh, pension records. You can reach, research them a little bit at ancestry.com. You can see those pension cards that I showed. I showed the card of Bayard Sorden. Um, so they have those. But if you want to get more pension records, I mean, this may have changed, but at the time I was doing this project, you had to write to the National Archives and pay them, pay somebody there to uh, look up the records, make copies, and they'll make copies for you and send them to you. Um, there are also private individuals who would, will do that too. Of course, you can also go to Washington DC and do it yourself if you're close enough. So um, uh, the only thing I will say in, in, in this particular, in the case of this particular project, there were several men who, who either lived long enough or their widows lived long enough that the National Archives did not have the pension records. And for those, I had to go to the, um, the Veterans Administration. And I got in touch with a very nice man who, it took him a long time, maybe six or eight months, but he finally tracked down all the pension records that I was missing and got made copies of them for me and sent them to me. They're really large. They're like 100, 200 pages sometimes. So, and a lot of it is stuff that's not all that interesting. I mean, for, I'm not really sure about white men who served, but for these men, the government made them prove over and over again you know, that they were disabled. They had to go to see doctors, you know, multiple times. And so there's a lot of stuff that's just like, oh, here's another doctor's form that a doctor has signed, you know? So, yeah. Uh, let's see what our next question is. Um, Ellen asks, was there a soldier or more than one that proved to be particularly challenging to research? Um, 
-hmm. Well, I think the man that you chose to put on your um, Bayard sword and the man that you chose to put on your um, sort of, what is that thing called that you have outside the, um, the museum, the- um, Promotional image yeah, banner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on your banner, yeah. He was really hard. When I saw his name, I thought, oh, this is gonna be so easy because he's got a really unusual name, Bayard Sorden. But it turned out that there was another man named Bayard Sorden who was close to his age. So it was really hard to tell the two apart. And Bayard just had an extremely complicated life. And so it was just, it was hard to know because he did put a, have a pension record and it was hard to know what was going on with him when he signed up. He was one of the men from Delaware who, he had been a slave, but it appeared he was not signed up by a slaveholder. It was unclear exactly how he had come to the military. Um, he moved around a lot afterwards. He worked at a, a stable in New York City that actually still exists. Um, I mean, it's not a stable anymore. Of course, it's somebody's very fancy house, but um, you know, it, he just, he was a challenge. He was a challenge. Yeah, so probably him. <laughs> All right. And now he's on our banner. <laughs> now he's on your banner. <laughs> Um, John asked, did any of the 17 upon leaving the USCT transfer to one of the four Buffalo Soldiers regiments? No, not that, not that, no, I don't think any of them did, no. Um, the other question is, uh, was there anything that really shocked or surprised you in the midst of your research? Well, I was shocked that slaveholders were allowed to um, to enlist their slaves and take the bounty. Yes, I was very shocked at that. But, you know, that was something that the government was doing to keep people in the border states a little happier so they didn't secede. At least that's my understanding of, of the thinking behind that. Um, so that was definitely shocking. Um, what, another thing that was interesting was uh, because um, I did get in touch with uh, James Tall, James Tall's uh, granddaughter, who you saw in the photo a couple slides back. She, uh, it was really interesting to talk to her about his history. And now he came from Tennessee, so he he was the the family doesn't doesn't have a huge amount of information, but they believe that he was uh, an escaped slave when he signed up. And he was one of the people that signed up in Waterford, PA. Uh, but they really just don't know much about the journey that he took from uh, Tennessee up to Pennsylvania to sign up. So it was really interesting to talk to her about, about him and, you know, and he was one of the the men that lived to be very old. So we got, I got a lot of information about him. And the family told me that they had had a photo of him. They didn't, it wasn't clear if it was a Civil War era photo, but they had had a photo of him and it had burned up when the house had burned down in a fire at some point. Mm. And another interesting aspect of James was that his son, because he lived to be, because James lived to be so old and he had several wives and quite a large number of children, he had a, a child late in his life. And that son, then that man, who was the father of the woman you saw in the photo, he had died like about the same time as I was finding out about this album. So I thought that was, it was so, it was so sad that he didn't live long enough to, you know, know about the album and, and get a copy of the photo. And, and, but it was interesting that there was that sort of uh, coinciding of events. Yeah, for sure. Um, somebody would like to know where in the Smithsonian Museum is the album on display? Because they're visiting in a couple of weeks. Um, it's on the second floor 
and it's it's uh i can't i'm sorry i can't remember the what the display is called because there's a military there's there's a usct section in the basement and it's not in that section it's on the second floor i feel like it's called community and and military or something like that but i'm sh i'm i feel pretty sure that if they go and say hey we'd like to see captain prickett's album somebody there will know where it is so, Excellent. Yeah. Yes, it is what three inches tall. So if you're just looking around for it, you might miss it. <laughs> Tiny. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question Did all 17 survive the war? Yes. Uh, all 17 men survived the war, uh, other than, well, we don't know about the one man who wasn't identified. So, but all the rest survived the war. And that is what has led. Um, the family and, and me to surmise that the uh, the photos were done probably late in the war, maybe even after it was over. I mean, the war was over in April, but these men weren't mustered out until December. So they were hanging around the camp or I mean, they had to make it back to uh, because they they mustered out in New Jersey, I believe. And so they had to make it back up from Florida and exactly how that happened, we don't really know, but they probably the photos were taken around then late later in the war or in that period before they mustered out. And uh, we also don't know who wrote the the names, but we think it was Captain Prickett. I mean, he's the logical, you know, the, the logical person, although it might have been his granddaughter who was helping him out who wrote who actually did the writing. And um, I mean, his grandson, his great grandson has tried to look at his writing and see if it matches up with the writing, but that's really hard to do. Um, mm. And another, another family story that, was, that came down through the years, really the only family story that came down was that Captain Prickett got really sick during the war and that some of his men, he credited some of his men and he told his family later, that some of my men helped me survive and I would not have survived if it had not been for, for these men. And we sort of wonder, well, were these the men that were really close to him, you know, that had helped him survive and were really close to him and were they the men, or did he want a record of them for that reason? And, and did he ask them for the photos or did they just say, hey, we really, you know, Captain Prickett, he went on to, William Prickett, he went on to be a, uh, a diplomat and go, to a couple of places overseas. So he clearly was a guy who had good people skills and, you know, um, and it's possible that the men just really liked him and said, hey, we want to do this for him, you know? We don't know. Yeah. Uh, Christine asks, um, I guess about the motivation for an enslaver enlisting their enslaved person. Was it just for the bounty or were there possible other reasons involved for making that move? Um, well, I would think it's uh, because, you know, this was their property and, um, you know, uh, it, it's possible that the men wanted to sign up and, you know, it's possible that the slaveholder, I mean, being very generous here, I would say it's possible that the slaveholder took the bounty and gave it to the men's family, but, but I don't know. We may never know, yeah. We'll never know, no. Um, here's a question I can answer. How long will the exhibit be in Westchester? Um, until at least January, uh, not January, <laughs> until at least July. <laughs> so you have a little bit of time. Um, and Ellen also made the uh, observation to that last question. It seems more interesting for an enslaver to place their enslaved person in the Union Army as opposed to the Confederate Army, which do you have anything uh, anything to observe about that? Um, well, I mean, I have heard that, you know, there were African American men that signed up for the Confederate Army. There have been claims of that. I don't, I have never researched that. I don't know how that worked. Um, I don't even know if that's really true. Um, I, 
I mean, if, if they were going for the bounty, it was gonna to have to be the Union Army. It was not gonna be the Confederate Army. I, as far as I know, there was no bounty for the Confederate Army either. Mm. Um, but I don't know, that's probably a, a good topic for somebody's like master's thesis or something. I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, but you know, we're, we're talking Delaware, Maryland. I mean, we're talking states that are you know, apparently in Delaware, there was, um, you know, a fair amount of sympathy for the Union. So, and, that, and that's where the enslaved men who were signed up by the slaveholder were from. They were from Delaware. There was, there was only one man in the whole group that was from Maryland, and he apparently was a free man who signed up on his own. So, yeah, hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know about uh, Maryland slaveholders, whether they would have been so keen. I don't, I don't know. Hmm. All right, if there are no other questions, I'm just checking the chat box real quick. Uh, I would like to thank you, Shane Davidson, for first, uh, being inspired to create this wonderful project, second, for actually following through on it, and third, for allowing us to have it. So <laughs> we are very, very proud to be the hosts for the 17 Men exhibit. As I said, we will be hosting it until at least July. Um, uh, just check in the chat box once more. And again, Civil War Trails for, uh, for making it possible for the exhibit to make it to us. So uh, if, if anybody has any questions for you, uh, do you have any web, uh, website contact information that you would like to share? Uh, they can just send it to my email address, um, which is shanedraws at gmail.com. So it's Shane, S-H-A-Y-N-E, draws, like D-R-A-W-S, uh, no spaces, at gmail.com. So if, if questions come up, feel free to do that. And as Shane mentioned a little bit earlier in the conversation, there is a book available uh, based on the exhibit. We have copies for sale in our museum store. Uh, if you would like to stop by and take a look at it, purchase it. Um, that's definitely one way to get it. Uh, are there other ways to purchase the book? They can also buy it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. All right. And I just want to mention Joyce Workman put in the chat box that, uh, that, that she would like to invite everyone to visit the Camp William Penn Museum between June and October. So mm -hmm. that's another place locally that uh, you can all go visit. Right. So thank you again everyone for joining us. Thank you for supporting CCHC. Thank you, Shane, for this wonderful exhibit. And thank I hope everyone it. has. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, thank you for the inspiration. I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people in the talk this evening. So everyone have a very safe, warm, wonderful evening. Get out and enjoy the sunshine, um, especially you, Shane, since you just came through a terrible ice storm oh, in Michigan. Yes. Thank, so. you. thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll be sending out the recording for this uh, in the next 24 hours. So please look for an email from me. And again, have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you.